today we want to talk to you guys about taking a step in faith and what that looks like. And we really want to share with you what our story is and how God used us in taking that step. And so my name is Mara and this is my husband Remington and we are the Accelerate Student Pastors. We're excited to bring the word of God to you guys today. But you know, when we decided we had started serving in Accelerate, God spoke to both of us and told us that we were supposed to speak. And we're pretty talkative people, but we're like, okay, what does that mean? What do you have we're, for us? What? We're like, speak. We talk every day. Like, we're good at it. <laughs> yeah. And so we were trying to, we're like, okay, God, we're going to do that. But like, what, what is that? And so we tried to justify it at first. Remington had started a podcast with a couple of his friends, Hunting, Fishing, and Jesus. You can talk to him about that later. But he started this podcast. He's like, that's what I'm supposed to do. Like, Obviously, I got it. And I'm like, oh, what about me? Like, I'm, like, I'm living God's plan. What are you doing? <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, well, I had started leading Peterson Outdoors Ministries in the women's side. And so I thought, okay, well, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so we've been doing that and we love it. But there was more. God wanted us to take a step more. And so he, um, later on, Brad and Missy had challenged some of the leaders to speak on stage and accelerate. And we're like, that's it. Like, that's what we're supposed to do. And so we told them we we're going to do it. They told us, like, this is how you make an outline. Well, then we kind of were like, we don't even know what to talk about. It took a while. And around the same time that we ended up um, coming up with what we were going to be talking about called the calling is what we spoke about the first time and what God called you to your life. God had told us multiple different ways that we were supposed to step into student ministry. And Remington's mom had applied for this job at another church as a youth pastor. And I was helping her with a resume and I was helping her answer all these questions. And I'm like, man, that sounds super fun. Like, I would love that. And I told um, Remington, I was like, I'm just going to ask like Brad and Missy, like what it takes to be a student pastor. The next day, they post on Facebook the job opening. I'm like, oh, okay, God, that's not what, like, I wasn't that serious. Like, what? <laughs> Pump the brakes. <laughs> like, hey, no, I'm good. And so I was like, well, that's really weird. And so I told Remington, and I was like, okay, do not tell a soul. Like, we are not qualified. Like, I love my job. Like, no one can know, but I'm just going to ask him about it. And he we go and I end up being on their podcast because one of the guys couldn't make it. And our friend goes, Hey, you should, um, did you guys see that job they posted? Like you should apply for it. And I'm looking at Remington, like you told him. Like, it was, it was what I would call like a rhetorical expression because I couldn't even defend myself. It was like the mom she, look of like, you're going to die she after was this. Mad. I was so mad. I was like, are you kidding me? You told him. And he's like, I did not. I promise. And I'm like, okay, God, you're being real weird. Like, I do not, like, I don't really know about this. And so then the, that week at Accelerate, one of the student leaders that came up to me and was like, hey, you guys should apply for that job. Like, we, I just immediately thought of you. And I'm like, okay, this is really weird. Like, why is all all of these people like how do they know these things and the next week she came up to us and was like hey I saw a vision I had a vision of you guys speaking on stage like you have to talk to Brian and Missy right now like you need to go and I'm like this is terrifying like I don't know I'm like we don't know what we're doing like we love serving and accelerate but y'all are crazy like this is crazy and so you know we knew, though, that when God calls you to something, and he clearly did in multiple different ways, he wants you to take that step in faith. And he's going to open those doors wide open, or he's going to slam them shut with whatever happens. Yeah, amen. He will. And he, he did. He obviously opened up the doors. And even though we didn't feel qualified, and even though we knew, like, we don't expect any of this. Like I was so comfortable with where I was at. Like I was teaching, I'd been teaching ag for three years and I loved my teaching partner, my students, my administration, like everything about where we were at. Like I was in Diamond, which is where Remington's hometown was. So it's like, I'm going to be here the rest of my life. Like this is it, you know? And God was like, no, like, this is what I have more for you. And you know, some of us here today, like he has more for us. He wants us to take that step in faith, no matter what it is. And we have to do it. And so faith is really taking that first step and then letting him guide you and lead you the rest of the way. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about someone 
who has just this incredible willingness to take that step of faith. Yeah. Like he is probably one of the most interesting people in the entire Old Testament. And he has just this amazing relationship with God. And in fact, in Deuteronomy 34.10, it says, since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. Today, we're talking about Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses was in constant conversation with God. The Lord knew him face to face. He was always talking to him. He was always relying on God for advice. And in Moses' early life, um, he lived at a time where the Israelites were living in Egypt, but they were being persecuted like crazy. I got to confess, um, when I was practicing this last week and getting ready for this message, I was going over that part right there, and I was like, yeah, the Israelites were being prosecuted like crazy in Egypt. And Mara's like, they ain't taking them to court. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But no, they were being persecuted like crazy. And um, it was almost like, uh, like a concentration camp type deal. They were put under slavery in these work camps and just, it was just insane. But in Hebrews eleven twenty three, it says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. So even though they were in these um, camps and they were working and everything, um, God was still blessing the Israelites. God was allowing them to reproduce fast and grow rapidly. And they were growing way faster than what the Egyptians were even. But uh, Pharaoh seen this, the king of Egypt seen this, and he was like, okay, I got to shut this growth down. Like I got to figure out some way to allow you guys not to grow anymore. And so he made a law saying that every male baby born was to be tossed in the Nile River was to be murdered, just tossed in the Nile River, every Hebrew baby boy. And so Moses hid him, Moses' parents hid him for three months because they saw that God had given him this unusual child. They saw that he was something special. And they had faith in God. They knew God. And they were not afraid to disobey the king's commands. So Moses was born of faith. His parents saw that he was something special. He was something a little bit unusual. And they hid him for three months. Well, Moses began to grow. And after the three months, they couldn't hide him anymore. And so it was either to kill him and give him up to the king or figure out a way to toss him in the Nile River. And so they made this basket out of papaya. And they covered it in tar, which allowed it to be buoyant. And they dropped Moses in this basket and floated him down the river. Instead of just tossing him in there like everybody else was, they just dropped him in this basket and floated. And ironically, the person that found him was the Pharaoh's daughter in the reeds. The person that was persecuting all of these uh, Israelites, his daughter is the one that found him. And so um, she had no faith in God. In fact, the Egyptians were worshiping false gods at the time. And um, so she didn't know anything about God. But even she seen that Moses was something special. She seen that he was not a normal baby. And so she took him and she adopted him. And Moses was raised up in the royal household for 40 years. He lived with the Egyptians. He was taught all the ways of the Egyptians. Actually, the Bible says that he was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was both powerful in speech and in action. He had everything. He was living the life of the rich and famous, guys. He had everything at the hand. He had his hands. He had servants. He had all the gold he ever wanted. He had everything. He had all the wisdom. And Moses spent 40 years here. But he even he during those 40 years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The Bible said that he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Guys, he knew his people followed God. The Egyptians we're living in sin constantly. He chose to be with them. And one day, he really had to make that decision between royalty and peasantry. He was going out and hanging out with his people in the, in the field. And he was going out and hanging out with them while they were working. And he witnessed this Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And so he looked around and made sure no one was watching. And he killed that Egyptian. And he went and hit him in the sand. And Life was good for about a day. And then the next day he was out there and he seen two Hebrews fighting. And he confronted the one that was in the wrong. And he's like, hey, you guys are 
on the same team. Like, why are you fighting? Like, you guys are supposed to be with each other, not against each other. And the Hebrew said, like, who elected you king over us? Like, who made you our judge, our king? He said, are you just going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? This freaked Moses out. And at this point, he realized that Pharaoh probably knew that he'd just killed this Egyptian. And so this sent him on a 40-year period of just really wandering in the wilderness. He went to run from Pharaoh and went into hiding. And um, I love how I was talking about the wilderness because God uses the wilderness in a lot of occasions, right? God, seeing that Moses was living the life of the rich and famous, he was, had every tool, he had all the equipment, all the luxuries of the, the fine life, you know, the rich life and everything. But he needed Moses to see that. You don't rely on that stuff. <laughs> It's time to go up on stage. It's time to do huddle. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but he's seen that Moses was living this luxurious life and he was relying on these things. And so I believe God sent him in this wilderness to strip him of a lot of that. He said, you don't need all this stuff. You don't need all this gold, all this wisdom that the Egyptians have given you. All you need is me. And so in this 40 years, uh, Moses ends up finding him a wife and he uh, begins to work for her father, and um, he was a shepherd. So he went from living the right life of the rich and famous and having all the gold he could ever want to being a shepherd of somebody else's sheep. He don't even own his own sheep here. And the Bible says that Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. He was just another day of work. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, to the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a burning bush. But this wasn't just a normal Northeast Oklahoma brush pile fire. This was like, this is a little bit different. This one hit a little bit different. This bush was being burned, but the bush wasn't being consumed by the fire. Nothing was getting burned up. The fire was around the bush, but it wasn't burning the bush up. And so this caught Moses' attention. He went over to investigate and the Lord spoke to him. And I truly believe at this moment when the, those words came out of that bush. Moses knew that it was from the Lord because when a bush talks to you, what other explanation is there, right? <laughs> Remington, yeah, yes, Lord. Yeah, <laughs> like that's, that's all I got. Okay. But the bush said, Lord said, Moses, Moses. And I love what Moses said to this. He said, here I am. Guys, when God calls your name and he calls you to go out and do something. You don't have to come up with an extravagant answer. You don't have to come up with a 20 question survey or whatever, trying to figure out what's going on. All you have to do is say, here I am. Yeah, that's good. So the God ends up telling Moses that he goes, I've hear, heard the cries um, of my people. He goes, I've heard the cries of the Israelites. They're um, just under this insane labor. They're being operated by their slave drivers. Life's not good for them. And he says, I'm going to use you to bring them out of Egypt. You guys got to think, this is a place that Moses is running from. This is a place that he went, he came from and he left because they were trying to kill him just 40 years ago. And he's still kind of in hiding in a way. And so God calls him and says, you're going to go there and you're going to bring these people out of there. And you got to think about Whenever he confronted those two Hebrews that were, you know, fighting against each other, they had zero respect for him too. Yeah. So not only does Pharaoh trying to kill him, but the Hebrews really don't have any respect for him either. So like he's out of his comfort zone and God does this so often. He pulls us out of our comfort zone. Guys, it's not comfortable being up on this stage, but I know I'm called to do this. I know I'm supposed to be doing this. God told me and Mara we were supposed to speak. Yeah. And nothing great is ever going to happen being comfortable anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Yeah, you know, a lot of the times we get this pulled out of our comfort zone and we have the enemy attack us and tell us all these things. And, you know, we think we're not qualified to do blah, 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 whatever he asked you to do. And Moses felt the same way. He didn't feel qualified. In 311, he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He's like, who am I? Like me? You ever had God tell you to do something? You're like me? Are you sure? Like, can you pass it on to the other person? Like, yeah, you, Moses. I think he meant you. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, you're going to not feel qualified. You're going to have doubt in your mind. You're going to think like, who am I to be the student pastor? Who am I to try to help students love Jesus? Like, but God is going to prepare you and he's going to use you and he's going to guide you the entire way. In 311, he says, who am I? And then God says in 312, God says, I will be with you. Yes. Guys, he's going to be with you through everything. He's going to guide you and he's going to lead you. Even when you go astray and you come back, I think about my parents and, you know, everybody's parents at some point told you like, you should not be friends with that person or you should not go to that thing. And yet for some reason we just do our own thing, right? No? no? Okay. I'm like, y'all are liars. Like up in here. All right. You do. You're like, yeah, I'm good. And then you come back and you go, oh yeah, mom, you're right. Like, that's God. God's trying to tell us, like, I want you here. I want you to take this step. And then half the time we're coming up with different excuses of why we can't do it. And then we're going, oh, I should have just followed the plan in the first place. I should have done what you wanted me to do because he will prepare you. And I love that um, he had to tell Moses more than once to go because, you know, when we stepped into ministry, he had to tell us multiple ways, like, you're supposed to do this because I think he knew, like, we're not very good we're, listeners. We're pretty slow learners. Really. Yeah. <laughs> and so he told Moses in 310, so now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses is like, why? Like, what about da, 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 excuse, excuse, excuse. And then in 412, now go, I will help help you speak and I will teach you what to say. He's going to prepare us. He's going to help us speak. He's going to teach us what to say. When we get called and we ask somebody, you know, you're supposed to go and tell your friend about Jesus. We've been there and you're like, ah, I'm not really qualified. Like, I don't know every single thing about the Bible. I don't know. Da, 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 da. Excuse, excuse. No, he wants you to step out and do it, and then he's going to tell you what to say. And, you know, when we stepped into ministry, I thought, we aren't qualified. Like, we don't know what we're doing. Like, we love these students. We love Accelerate. We love Jesus. But, like, we don't know. And as we went through different processes, we realized, like, he was prepping us our entire lives. Like, he had been planning for this for so long. I'd been teaching for three years, and I had to do budgets, and I had, um, I took kids to FFA camp, and I took kids to all of these different activities, and obviously built connections with them to where all of these things was like, oh, well, I can do this. I can do what you've called me to do because you've been prepping me and planning for this for a long time. It doesn't mean it's not going to get hard. It doesn't mean that you know everything. You don't. Like, we do not know everything whatsoever. But one thing that we always go back to and we always remember is that somebody told us this. It says, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. So he doesn't call you and say, hey, I want you to do this. And then you already know every single thing and you have the whole entire plan. And then you go and do it. No, he's going to call you and he's going to say, you need to take that step. And then I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to, you're going to have to rely on me completely. Just like he did with Moses. Like Moses didn't know everything. He didn't know how it was going to work, but he still took the step of faith and he did what God called him to do. So you have to say, you have to say, here I am Lord. And then you have to listen and you have to go. Yeah. And point number three is you have to be ready for opposition. Yeah. And I almost hate even talking about this because this kills more um, callings than, than anything is when you step out in your calling and you say, okay, Lord, use me. The enemy is absolutely going to hammer you like nobody's business. He wants nothing more than for you to quit and you to just give up on it because he is the root of all evil. He is just it. He's just trying to get you to stop. And so you have to be ready for that opposition and it's going to happen. You know, I remember um, one of Mara and I's first out-of-state turkey hunts. Like, I'm a big turkey hunter. I turkey hunt all over the country. Like, that's my thing. And I remember the first time I ever took Mara out-of-state, and we went up to Shattern, Nebraska. It's the south part of the Black Hills. It's the most beautiful, pristine country you've ever seen. And there's just absolutely a ton of turkeys up there. Like, it is on like Donkey Kong. And so... We, we, uh, we hop in the car and we drove all night and the whole way up there, I'm telling her, I'm like, you're with the right guy. Like we are going to fill every tag we have. We're going to fill the freezer. Like 
this is going to be an insane trip. And so we're driving up there. We get up there. And one of the first things I do when I get up there is I just spend the day just driving around and just trying to get the layout of the land figured out and at least get some birds found and get a game plan for the next morning, right? So we do that. And I don't really think we've seen a bird the entire day up until the very last part of the evening, like right before dark, Mara spots this turkey in this guy's backyard. <laughs> and we really had to look at the turkey to make sure it wasn't his pet turkey. And so she, she spots this turkey and it's strutting. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a turkey strut, but it's strutting in this guy's garden. And so we go down and we find out that it's a wild bird and we go knock on the guy's door and two and a half hours later and me helping him fix his toilet, he ends up giving us permission to hunt this place. <laughs> he's you like, fix the he's like, you guys got the green light, go ahead. But then he tells us, he says, yeah, you can go and hunt the garden right there, but I have 3,000 more acres on the back side of that garden. Go have at it. Like, here you go, which is more land than I've ever had access to. This is amazing, you know? And so like, we're pumped. Like, I remember going to bed that night, and I hardly slept. Like, I was so excited. We found a turkey, literally had to walk 25 yards out the guy's back door, and it was on like donkey. Like, it was awesome. And so, we get out there at four in the morning, and I don't know if you guys know how turkey hunting works, but what you do is you, you get them to gobble, and then you make a game plan. I don't set in blinds, or I, I just, I'm too impatient. I can't set in a blind or anything like that. So, I get them to gobble, and then I make a game plan on them, and I try to go get close to them. And I try to call him in as close as I can. So we're sitting there in the guy's garden, and it felt almost wrong because we walked like 25 yards from the car, and we're ready to hunt. felt weird. But so we're sitting in this guy's garden, and it's starting to get daylight, and it's like that prime time, except for we didn't hear anything. No gobbling, no nothing. It's quiet as a cemetery on a dark night. Like it is nothing is happening, other than maybe a few distant gobbles. And then miles we, away. <laughs> yeah, miles away. It's open country. And then we spend the next, what, 15 hours of that day chasing what seemed like a ghost. <laughs> like, we, they would gobble over here, and we'd go over there, and they wouldn't be there. And then they would gobble over here on the other side of the place, and they wouldn't be there when we got there. Twelve miles later. <laughs> Twelve miles later. <laughs> In fact, I think we only seen one bird that entire day. And... We were sitting there glassing, which is something I never do for turkeys. So we're sitting there with our binoculars looking on this mountain. And Mara spots it again, a bird way on the next mountain, the next ridge over. And she's like, you think we can get to it? And I said, well, if we had a helicopter, we probably could. But that's about it. <laughs> and so we come back to the hotel room that night, and we were completely just destroyed. Like we were mentally exhausted. We'd walk 12 to 15 miles that day and only had a bottle of water apiece. And I remember getting back to the car and we hadn't ate anything all day because I'm an idiot and I didn't pack any snacks for any of us. Story and, of our lives. Yeah, yeah. And so we get back to the car and all we had to eat, there's nothing around, no towns, no nothing. And all we had to eat was um, a Lunchable, wasn't it? a pizza Lunchable that had been sitting in a hot car all day and it was like 80 degrees outside. It was delicious. Guys, I'm telling you. I mean, <laughs> I don't remember what it tastes like, but I know how I felt afterwards, and it was great. <laughs> so we get back to the hotel that night, and I am completely mentally exhausted. Like, I am as beat up and as humbled as I've ever been by these turkeys, okay? And also, I'm a little embarrassed because I've been telling Mara that, like, I'm a turkey slayer. Like, I am, like, a turkey's worst nightmare. We're going to kill a lot of birds. And we didn't even get close enough to shoot a bird, so I'm embarrassed. But... And I do this all over the country. Like, I, I travel all over. And one thing I always do um, on these hunts is when I'm struggling, I always call my dad. And he always gives me this, these words of advice. And I talked to my father for a little bit. And I called him that night, and I said, hey, dude, I said, I am struggling. And he said, it's day one. And I said, I'm really struggling. <laughs> he said I, said, I told him, I said, I'm literally to the point of selling every bit of turkey hunting stuff I have and taking up Frisbee golf or something or like, give me something good because I'm going to be at the Waffle House instead of the Turkey Woods in the morning. And so he tells me, and I'll never forget what he said. He, he said, Rem, you know what you're doing. He said, just stay on your path. Just stay going. Just keep at it. Do, do what you do. You've done this in a million different times. He said, keep going. He said, tomorrow is a brand new day. He said, it'll turn like a light switch. Guys, this is exactly what I feel like Moses had. 
He was in constant conversation with his father. And a little later on from what we's told in the story, he gets sent to Pharaoh and it doesn't work out. And so he talks to God and God gives him another step. And then he gives him another step and another step. And next thing you know, God has brought the Israelites out of Egypt. So back to the turkey story. We woke up the next morning. My dad's conversation gave me just an insane amount of energy. I was ready to go. I woke up um, like a spider monkey. I was ready to go. And we got there at four in the morning, went to the garden, sat there in the garden. And within 15 minutes of us being there, I killed my bird. And then an hour later, Mara shot her bird. And we were on a vacation in South Dakota within the first two hours of us being there. I mean, it was just beautiful. And it was just amazing how that gave us a lot of energy and just gave us, kept us refreshed and kept us going. Yeah. So when you're in opposition, you got to constantly talk to your father, like no matter what. Moses, you know, he didn't have it easy. It wasn't just one thing and then it happened. No, God's timing was absolutely perfect. It's always exactly what he wants. So when you're struggling through something and you're like, why God, why God, why God? Like you told me to do this and he's not doing it. His timing is perfect. So you got to wait. You have to be patient. But I love because Moses, you know, he went and then he talked to God and then he went and then he talked to God and he didn't rely on himself. Like God told him to do it and he used himself, but then he relied on God constantly. He humbled himself. He let himself be, you know, just completely whatever God, I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to go after you because it's God's timing and it's what God wants. And God was using Moses. It wasn't Moses that was doing anything. It was all God. And I love Hebrews 11, 6, because this is when Moses, he obviously stepped out in faith to do this. It says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It's impossible, impossible to please God if you don't have faith. You have to take that first step. You have to be willing and obedient and take the first step and then let God lead you the rest of the way. You have to say, here I am, Lord. You can have whatever it is. I'm here for you. I'm going to do whatever you call me to do. He's going to talk to you and you're going to have to listen. And then you're going to have to go and be ready for that opposition. Whatever it is, whatever God has called you to do, step out in faith today. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for just the opportunity to be able to just be in your presence today. And God, I thank you for just always having a plan and a purpose for our lives. Thank you for just being able to just give us the next steps constantly, as long as we listen to what you have to say. And you know, there's some of you in this room that just need to know, like, God does have a purpose and a plan for your life. And you are not here on accident. Like, you are here on purpose. And he has an assignment for you. He wants you to take that next step, whatever it is, whatever he has for you. And I want to ask some of you guys, you know, if you've never taken that first step and you've never had that relationship with Jesus and never said, you know, I'm all in. I want to go after you, God, and I want to know who you are. Know that you don't have to be qualified. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be this perfect person. God says, come as you are. Come as you are. And if you want to take that step today, if you want to say, I want to have a relationship with you, I want you to just raise your hand. I want to know who I can be praying for you. And I want to know, like, I'm all in. I want to go after you, God. And if that's you today, I just ask that you just raise your hand. Now is your chance to be able to say, here I am, all of me. And as a family of Mountain River Church, you know, we join in together and we say this prayer together. So repeat after me. God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me for everything I've done. Erase my past and make me new. I believe with all my heart. Jesus is the Son of God. It is only through him that I can truly be saved. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. Amen.